this is your host, Alan Brooks, for another edition of Secret Stories of Christ's Return in the Old Testament. And today, specifically, we're going to be finishing up Isaiah and moving on, perhaps, to Hosea and some other chapters in the Bible. And so what do I mean by secret stories? Well, I found that the way the Bible and the prophets wrote was not exactly like some of the experts that we talk to now think they do. Like, you know, the experts, these are the same people who 2,000 years ago missed Jesus because they had it figured out that he was going to come like a triumphal king when he was supposed to come as a suffering servant. So they missed it. God bless their hearts. They, they missed it. And today we hear all sorts of theories about the end of time, pre-tribulation rapture, post-tribulation rapture, four raptures, you know, two resurrections, a fifth rapture after the fourth trumpet, and then another rapture before the fifth trumpet. I don't know. You know, they have all these complicated charts, all these experts on the end times. I get that. They're trying to do the best they can, like all of us. They're trying to understand, what does the Bible say about the end? Well, I studied this subject for 35 years, and I found some new discoveries, I feel. If some people have found them other than me, well, you know, God bless them. I've never seen it. And what did I find, you might ask? Well, you know, where to begin, really? Well, if you're going to study something in the Bible, you probably want to look at every version of the same thing you're looking at, right? Like, you know, Jesus fed the 5,000. So you might want to not just look at one version, but every version, right, to get every little added detail that you can. And the Bible was written in a a way that I've discovered is called description redescription. That is, a prophet will make a prediction and then go back and give details about that description later. You know, it's like a movie flashback, but they don't say, hey, getting back to that original prediction. No, they don't. An example is like... uh, Genesis 1, God made Adam and Eve. Genesis 2, acts as if Genesis 1 never happened. God created man and Adam and Eve, right? Why? Well, the reason why is because uh, that's just the way they spoke. And that's why people have a hard time with the book of Revelation. So what did we get out of the second description of man's creation? Well, I looked it up. One website says we saw how sin was transferred from Adam and Eve to the rest of the human race. Okay, so we got some additional information, right? This this process of description, redescription, if you read Genesis, it's all through it. They'll have a a description of something that happened. Then they'll go back and redescribe it with more details. But they don't say, getting back to that thing I just spoke about. No, unfortunately, they didn't talk that way. But they kind of talked in what I'd call prophetic utterances, where they would see something and speak it forth, and then see that same thing again later and uh, speak it forth. And so, how then, Alan, did you find anything about the end times? What new discoveries did you make, huh? Well, I found that, you know, like looking at all stories of the feeding of the 5,000 by Jesus, you would do a search, right? Right? Feeding of 5,000. Likewise, if you were looking for things about the end of time, you would do a search for, you know, coming on the clouds. Sun, moon, and stars are darkened because the central future prophetic event of the Bible is when Jesus Christ comes back in the sky. And when he comes back, it says somehow the stars will fall, the moon will be darkened, and the sun will be darkened, so it's going to be dark. And somehow Jesus is going to come back in that darkness and be a light streaking across the sky. And uh, all the nations will see him. And there's a last trumpet that sounds. Matthew 24 talks about that. And at that trumpet, the elect are gathered up in an event called the rapture. Now, there's a big controversy. Some people say the rapture happened seven years before. Some years say it happens three and a half years before. I mean, what are they talking about, Alan? Well, let me get to that. But first, I just wanted to say the central event 
in the Bible is when God comes back here and he's going to set up his kingdom and we're going to have a thousand year millennium of peace and safety where God's here on earth and there ain't going to be no war, the wolf alive with the lamb and all that stuff. I'm sure you've heard about the millennium. Adolf Hitler tried to uh, have a millennium himself, the third right of the third thousand years. So, you know, he was like an antichrist. And as far as the rapture, yeah, there is a rapture. There is a last trumpet when Jesus comes back. Now, whether it's only the only rapture, hey, if there's one seven years before, I can, I'll go for that. Wouldn't you? But I don't know. I'm just saying when Jesus Christ comes back, there's a rapture. There's a trumpet. People are gathered. And this story is over and over and over all through the Old Testament. And you probably haven't heard anybody teach about it, have you? And so I did a search for all the times when God comes back. And I began to see, well, what if I looked around that event and before it a couple of chapters and see what I found? I guess it would be like uh, World War II. If you looked for, a, if there was a book about Pearl Harbor and World War II and you put a search mission in for Pearl Harbor and the atom bomb, and then you saw all of a sudden the same sequence of events uh, over and over again. You saw in chapter one, Pearl Harbor, Chapter 2, you know, something else, Midway, the Battle of Midway. And Chapter 3, three and a half years later, the A-bomb is dropped at Hiroshima. Now, that's actually kind of what happened. And so what if you did that same search and you found every three chapters the same sequence? You found Pearl Harbor, the Battle of Midway. Three and a half years later, the atomic bomb was dropped at Hiroshima. And each time there was a little bit different information that kind of gave you a better overall understanding. If you saw it once or twice, you might think, well, whatever, it's a coincidence. If you saw it, however, 15 to 20 times, you might think, hmm, somebody's out to show me something here, Georgia Bible. And so I did the same thing with Jesus Christ coming back. He, he's coming back, and what do we know is going to happen when he comes back? There's going to be, in Matthew 24, the sun, moon, and stars are darkened. Um, he sends out his angels with a trumpet call, gathers the elect, and then we know after he comes back in Revelation 19, he's going to come back and put it to the armies of the Antichrist, Georgia Bible. So he's going to come down and, you know, take care of all the armies that are of the bad, ouchy, ouchy people. Nice person's Bible. And he's going to then set up his thousand-year kingdom. So we know that's what's going to happen. So what did I find before that? What did I find, you know, did I find a pattern? And I did. I found out that there's something called the Day of the Lord, which nobody talks about. There's something called peace. It happens when people say peace that also nobody talks about. And so and that also kind of what launched my discovery because Jesus said that the last three and a half years is so much distress. How could there be uh, peace? It's a contradiction. So basically what I found out is that the Bible has one final seven-year period, Daniel 9.27, where the Antichrist, whoever he is, makes some sort of treaty with Israel, and then after three and a half years or in the middle, this Antichrist character invades Israel and breaks the peace treaty then he, Israel flees, that's one of those little code words like Hiroshima or atom bomb. And Israel flees, and then we know the Antichrist, according to many different places, rules the world or the known world or much of the Islamic world for three and a half years, like, like uh, our example in Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor was attacked, and three and a half years later, Hiroshima happened. Likewise, the Bible says Israel is going to be struck, and three and a half years later, Jesus Christ is going to come back. And that three and a half year, 42 months, 1260 days is the day of the Lord, the time of Jacob's trouble. The Bible calls that the time of great distress, the greatest tribulation the world has ever known. Those are all different names given to the same time frame, the time right before God comes back to rule the earth. It's called the last three and a half years and the time of Jacob's trouble. Now, why? 
Well, a lot of us have been taught the Antichrist kind of waltzes into the temple. He's a Jewish Messiah. The Jews accept him, and everybody's uh, at, he has he comes into Israel on a wave of adulation and suddenly turns. Well, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says he's a Gentile. He's the worst of the Gentiles, Ezekiel 7. Then it says this Antichrist is going to come in and thrash Israel, desolate her is the consistent word, one of those code words, desolate. Israel, you're going to be desolate at the end of time, the Bible says over and over again. And then when God comes back, he's going to comfort her. He's going to rebuild her and love on her. But first, he is going to send this Antichrist to invade Israel to make her desolate. Now, why? Well, I theorize it may be because she's starting sacrificing again when, um, you know, he's already given, God has already given his only son. And Isaiah 1 speaks of this. It says, Isaiah 1, Israel, God says to Israel, I reject your sacrifices and you're very bad. And then Isaiah 2, God comes back. So, you know, in the, that's in context with the end of time. So, speaking of context, a lot of the experts disagree with what I found because they snarkily comment about how I'm not hermeneutical. Now, what's hermeneutics? It's, you know, keeping, keeping it real. If there's a story of Jesus feeding the 5,000, you don't take a bit of that story and apply it to something else. Yeah, I got that. But prophetic utterances is a whole different story. Like if you looked at Psalms 34 through 43, in each one of them, there's a little snippet of a prediction about Jesus, about Judas, about the things that happened when Christ was on earth. Now, not everything in each of those Psalms was, a, was hermeneutical, right? And that's what I found, is that a lot of predictions are like a Holy Spirit prophetic utterance that happens in the middle of other things. And so that's why you can't always say, you know, it's not hermeneutical and dismiss it. You have to look at the overall picture. It's like if over a couple of three chapters in our example about World War II, if there was the words Pearl Harbor, Japanese planes attack, Midway, and 42 months, and then the atom bomb at Hiroshima, well, if that pattern happened over and over again, no, it may not be hermeneutical in that everything around those prophetic utterances 100% apply to them, but one could see that, yeah, there's something there. There's a true story that actually happened. You know, it's like Jesus in Isaiah 7, a virgin will give birth. His name will be Emmanuel, God with us. Well, there's a lot of stuff in Isaiah 7 that doesn't seem to fit. So are we going to just throw that out? No. So please don't throw out what I have here. It's the same thing. I found out that there's these prophetic utterances that happen in consecutive chapters many times over a few chapters, and they like the whole World War II story. They're just like that, that they start when Israel's invaded and Israel has to flee. Those are two code words like Pearl Harbor and Midway. And then after Israel flees, sometime later, Jesus Christ is going to come back in the air with the sun, moon, and stars darkened, and Armageddon will take place. That is the sequence of events that is, happens in the Old Testament, say, you know, 20 times. And for some reason, you know, experts don't want to look at the Old Testament. I did. You know, I'm a simple-minded, naive person. I get that. And so, uh, without question, all the experts will bring up one verse, and they'll say, Alan, what about Joel 2.31? You're, you're wrong. Well, okay, experts, so what about that one verse? It says, before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. See there, Alan, you're trying to tell us that uh, the day of the Lord starts three and a half years before that event. You see, everything in the Bible is within a single framework. There's one last seven-year period, one ring to rule them all, and it's divided into two, three-and-a-half-year time frames. And what divides it? The Antichrist invades Israel, causes her to flee. Kind of like 
The last three and a half years of World War II started when the Japanese invaded Pearl Harbor. Then we would know, 42 months later, the H-bomb would happen. In the same way, the Bible has that same sequence over and over again. So I find 15 to 20 places where the day of the Lord, whatever that is, is uh, an invasion of Israel when people say peace. Paul said that. And, you know, I know most of us have probably thought the day of the Lord is just the last big battle. That's what we've been taught, and it looks that way according to that verse in uh, Joel 2.31. Well, what's the answer? The answer is the word before there could mean, uh, you know, not as in 20 minutes before. If we said we came and sat before the king, we wouldn't think it meant 20 minutes before. We would think it meant before, as in... In the sight of is what another way the Englishman's concordance says that word can be translated lipni. Hey, I'm not an expert. I'm just giving you one possible explanation because I have something called the preponderance of evidence theory. If there's 20 other places that say one thing and then this one verse leans the other way, well, I'm going to go with the 20. How about you? So anyway, that's that's what I wanted to get out of the way first is that's what people say. The day of the Lord says it's right at the end, right here in Joel, but they don't even look at the other verses, which says it happens in peace and safety. So I came to the conclusion after a lot of research that the day of the Lord has to start in the middle of that last seven year period, has to be the Antichrist invading, and because the same keywords are all throughout the Bible. Jesus said, When you see the abomination in the temple, which is the Antichrist in the temple, Israel, you have to flee. Right now, don't even get your stuff because these armies are so bad. And that those key words are all throughout the Old Testament as well, which makes sense, right? Wouldn't the one God give one message about the one end of time to all of his prophets and even use the same words and phrases? Of course he would. And that's what I found out, that there is one message. And it starts with people say peace. It says it's the day of the Lord, and which is an invasion of Israel when people say peace. Israel flees, that's one of those code words, you know, not the flee on your dog, but flees out of town fast, and then there's a three and a half year period of the worst distress the world has ever known, the worst tribulation the world has ever known, and at the end of that period is when Jesus Christ comes back in the sky and rules forevermore, and that's what we're all looking forward to, right? So let's get to Isaiah now told you a few things I believe in and have found, and there's more details about it in some of my other studies. Um, but as we, in the last study, uh, part two, the second coming or the return of Jesus in the Old Testament, we saw how Isaiah 1, uh, the first 27 chapters, almost all of them, have some sort of connective data to Jesus or the end of time. In the last teaching, uh, part two, we saw Isaiah 1 through 5 was one such uh, body of information. I call it a loop. My book's called The Loop, how end times or how the Old Testament prophets repeated the same end time prophecies over and over again in consecutive chapters as well. Yeah, it's a new discovery as far as I know. Uh, so Isaiah 1 talks about the Lord rejects Israel's sacrifices and decrees Israel to become desolate, to buy an invasion, to purge her. Then Isaiah 2, everyone will see the Lord returning in the air. So that's one, what I call a description in my description, read description theory, which is the Bible or a prophet will give an overview prophecy and then go back later and give details about that prophecy to help us understand it. In other words, they'll repeat the same prophecy many times, and uh, But they won't say, you know, this is a movie flashback about that prophecy. No, they'll just repeat it. And that's why people get confused. They think these are like a different prophecy about something else. So anyway, Isaiah 1 and 2 would be the description. You know, Israel is going to be invaded and desolate. And then Isaiah 2, everybody's going to see Jesus Christ coming back. Then Isaiah 3 through 5 is the redescription on the God's going to judge the Israel on the day of the Lord, 
And then Isaiah 4 and 5, the branch, which is Jesus' code word name in many places in the Bible. Um, As the world is in darkness, Jesus, the banner, stands in the air and whistles for his people to come and join him in the sky. That's a pretty incredible scene, don't you think? So we see the description, you know, God rejects Israel essentially in chapter 1, chapter 2. Then Jesus Christ comes back. Chapter 3 starts the redescription. You know, God's going to judge Israel because Israel's sinning. And then God's going to judge her on the day of the Lord, which is my my theory is that the day of the Lord starts that last three and a half year period of great distress. It starts when people say peace. And we saw that in the previous teachings, how Ezekiel and Jeremiah all say the day starts when people say peace, like Paul. Paul says, when people say peace and safety, the sudden destruction of the day of the Lord happens. And uh, so I thought that's a contradiction since Jesus said there's so much distress that uh, unless I come back, people, no life's going to be spared. So I theorized that the day of the Lord has to be that last three and a half year period. For it's only in the middle of this final seven year peace treaty will Israel even be at a peace. A lot of the experts want to say, well, there's going to be peace at the end. I don't think so. Jesus said, first of all, there's so much distress, unless I come back and cut those days short, no life would be spared. And, you know, second of all, Israel will have fleed, according to Jesus and many prophecies, out of the Antichrist invasion in the middle of this final seven years. So they're not their people. So no, there isn't going to be peace at the end. So Isaiah 1 through 5 is one loop of predictions. And then Isaiah 6 through 11 was another one which repeated the same information. It's absolutely absolutely astounding about that. It repeats how, you know, God's upset with his people. uh, Or let's, you know, Isaiah 7 is a virgin gives birth. Isaiah 8, then the king of Assyria invades Israel, which, you know, we go, what's that all about? Well, that's really actually a time warp to the end of time. Uh, because the king of Assyria is the Antichrist, and Assyria today is like Iran, Muslim nations north of Israel, right? Lower Soviet Union. So the, that's where the Antichrist is going to come from. He's not the Pope. He's not Monsanto or Halliburton or GMO, okay? He's, 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 he's a Gentile from former Soviet Union nations for, uh, or for lower Soviet Union nations former Soviet Union, and Muslim nations of Iran, Iraq, Turkey. Somewhere up there, this Antichrist is going to come down. He's going to sweep through and invade the lower Sunni nations because he's Shia and pretty much thrash all of them. Then, in a surprise move, he's going to invade Israel. That's why it's unexpected. And where, where is all that, Alan? Are you pulling it out of your tail feathers? No, I'm not. That's in Dan- at the end of Daniel 11. It talks about this massive sweep through evasion. Invasion of uh, the north, the armies of the north invade the southern Middle Eastern nations and then attack Israel. And that makes sense. The Shias hate the Sunnis and the Sunnis hate the Shias. So you can see how that is predicted here. And... Um, So Isaiah 9 repeats that same Isaiah 7 prophecy, basically saying, unto us a child is born, which is like Isaiah 7, you know, a virgin will give birth. And then Isaiah 9 talks about at the end of time there's going to be darkness, and Jesus Christ is going to come and pierce that great darkness. I mean, what a picture, just like we know is going to happen. And then Isaiah 10 repeats the same prophecy of Isaiah 8, is the, I sent the Assyrian to punish my people, but now I'm going to punish him. And then Isaiah 11 completes this loop by saying, Jesus from the root of Jesse will stand as a banner in the sky for all the nations to see. So you can see yet the first 11 chapters are all about Jesus or the end of time with Jesus coming back, right? Then Isaiah 12 through 14, yet another loop. Isaiah 15 through 19, yet another loop that ends with Jesus coming back. Isaiah 20 through 27 was an astounding loop that talks about, again, the king of Assyria comes and takes over Egypt for about three years, which, you know, the Antichrist, as I've said, rules for three and a half years. So that's about three years. 
Then it talks about the sweep through invasion. Persia comes and attacks labor pains, causes labor pains. Um, and that day, Isaiah 22, I'll, I'll, I'll summon my servant, the son of Hilka. He'll have the key, which Revelation 3, 7 says Jesus has the key. So we know who that is. Then Isaiah 24 says, The Lord devastates the earth at his return. Jerusalem is desolate. Its gate is battered, and there's a famous sealed gate right now in Israel. The moon and sun are darkened. The Lord will come back and reign from Mount Zion. Then Isaiah 25 through 27 talk about the dead rise. The living saints are raptured and gathered one by one from all over the globe at the last trumpet. That's exactly what Paul said. Paul said, Behold, I show you a mystery, that at the end of time, the, the dead will rise first, and then we who are alive will join the Lord in the air at the last trumpet. And here at Isaiah 25 through 27, same thing. Dead rise, they go to their rims to wait for a little while. The trumpet, the elect are gathered from all over the globe. It's the same prophecy, even down to the sun, moon, and stars being darkened, just like Jesus said in Matthew 24. Get that? Isaiah 24, Matthew 24, same event. So my whole theory is that the one God, the same God, gave the same predictions about the same time frame, even using the same words and phrases. Makes sense, right? And so we saw that here. So I'm going to the next string of predictions, which is Isaiah 28 through 30. One, I'm sorry, Isaiah 28 through 30, which if you remember, the whole premise that we have here is that there's one final seven-year time frame starts with a treaty or a covenant, as Daniel 9.27 says. Thus he will make an agreement with many. And then in the middle of that agreement, he breaks it, the Antichrist, and invades Israel, goes into the temple, stops the sacrifices, and says, I am God. And then he rules the uh, much of the world for three and a half years, and then Jesus comes back with the sun, moon, and stars darkened. Well, what do we have here in Isaiah 28 through 30? The same progression. Isaiah 28, in that day, Israel will make a covenant with death, but it will be annulled. And then I will lay in Zion a precious cornerstone. You know, Jesus is called the chief cornerstone. So you can see how Jesus is all over Isaiah. I even in my book, I call Isaiah the fifth gospel. Why? Because almost every chapter is about Jesus and the end of time. It's, it's crazy. The, you know, it's almost like too much. You can't believe it even unless you see it. And why don't people see this? It's because what I'm doing for you is I'm just taking these little prophetic utterances or the, the little secret code words that tie each other, tie one another together to form these secret stories. If you don't do that, then you're going to see all these other words that like kind of throws you. But we know like when Jesus fulfilled stuff in the Psalms, there was a lot of other words there too. So this is the same thing. So we need to look for the code words like Pearl Harbor, you know, Hiroshima. These code words are, you know, some sort of treaty. You know, Israel will be invaded. So that's our code words. And then Jesus Christ comes back in the air. So Isaiah 28, Israel will make a covenant with death. There's that seven-year peace treaty of Daniel. But God says, I'm going to lay a precious cornerstone. Jesus, he's the chief cornerstone, right? Isaiah 29, Israel will be brought low, but her enemies will be suddenly destroyed when the Lord does what? He comes back in fire. Then Isaiah 30 says, the Lord comes back in fire and destroys who? Assyria, to the music of the saints. Can you see that? We have the same picture yet one more time from the seven-year peace treaty to Israel being brought low by an invasion in the middle of that treaty by the Antichrist, to the Lord coming back at the end of that seven years, and destroys who? The Vatican? The United States? No, Assyria. That same code word name of the country over and over and over happens all throughout the Bible. It's in Micah. It's in all over. You know, it's it's amazing. It's, a, you know, when Joel, Joel 2.20 says... I will drive the northern army far from you when Jesus comes back. It, in Micah 5, it says, When the Assyrian marches into our land, I will raise up uh, you know, angels against them, basically. So we see this thing over and over. So the, the Antichrist is not 
you know, Monsanto, Halliburton. It's not, uh, you know, George Bush or, you know, Barack Obama, even though, you know, if Barack Obama would have to lie less to be the Antichrist. That's a joke, people. Anyway, um, no, I, I don't know who it is. But it says here he's the Assyrian, and we see that word, code word, Assyrian, over and over again. And we see here in Isaiah 20, 28 through 30, a mini little run, a loop of the last seven years. Starts with a covenant with death. Israel's brought low in the middle. But whoever did this to Israel will be destroyed when God comes in fire at the end. I hope you can see that. It's not that hard, is it? I mean, could Isaiah 31 through 35 be another one of these little loops of information? No, nah, but let's look anyway, okay? Isaiah 31, the Lord will protect and save Jerusalem and destroy who? Assyria with a sword that is not mortal. You know, in Revelation 19, it talks about Jesus Christ coming back to judge the world at the Battle of Armageddon, and he has a sword in his mouth. Can you believe that? Let's just look at that right now. It talks about Revelation 19, 11. I saw heaven opened, and there was a white horse. And he who sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. Verse 12. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no one knew except himself. Verse 13. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name was called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on the white horse. And then 15, now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, a sharp sword, that with it he could strike the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he himself treads the winepress of wrath and wrath of Almighty God. Now isn't that an amazing picture? And that's exactly the picture we see here in Isaiah. It's over and over and over again. It says, Jesus Christ, in verse 31, he's going to protect Jerusalem and destroy Assyria with a sword that's not mortal. That's Jesus Christ when he comes back, folks. That's not a mortal sword, right? Then Isaiah 32 and 33. When that happens, a king will reign in righteousness. That's the thousand-year millennium. Jesus Christ, the king, will reign for that time in righteousness, right? The Lord will be king in Zion, and the arrogant people who used to occupy her will be no more. Can you see that, people? Can you see that they did occupy? Some people take some verses and say, God's protecting Israel and Jerusalem for all time from everything. And that's just not what the Bible says. The Bible says over and over that he's going to allow his people to be invaded and struck by this northern Assyrian army. Then he's going to come back and deal with them. That's what Isaiah 10 says. Although I sent the Assyrian against my people, now I'm going to get you, sucker, inner city Bible. That's what it says if you go read Isaiah 10. So anyway, back to this. Isaiah 34. This is the day of the Lord's vengeance. His sword is bathed in blood. Exact word for word of what we just saw in Revelation 19. Isn't that amazing? That's just Word for word, that's a description of what happens when Jesus Christ comes back. And then Isaiah 35, the millennium starts as the blind see, and the redeemed of the Lord return to Zion. You know, like that famous song, Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return, and come with singing unto Zion. So we see yet another five-chapter loop of information of the same story. That at the end of time, and maybe it's even a continuation of Isaiah 28 through 30, which, you know, there's a covenant of death, 28, 30. Israel's going to be brought low in the middle of the last seven years. And, but God's going to take care of her enemies in Isaiah 30 when he comes back in, in fire and destroys who? Assyria to the music of the saints. Can you picture that? We're going to be singing all these songs in heaven, and God says, I'm going to go do it myself. We're just going to watch. What a scene that will be. And then at that time, Isaiah 31 sort of continues the story. The Lord will protect and save Jerusalem and destroy Assyria with that sword coming out of Jesus' mouth that's not mortal. And then Isaiah 32 and 33, then Jesus Christ will reign 
in righteousness, and the arrogant people who used to be there ain't going to be there no more. Georgia Bible. And Isaiah 34 continues, saying, This is the day of the Lord's vengeance, which is really amazing. His sword is bathed in blood. That's obviously Armageddon, right? And, you know, that's a famous scripture that Jesus prayed over himself in the temple, Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. Now, what's interesting is Jesus did not say 2,000 years ago the last part of that, and the day of the vengeance of our God. And so we see here, yeah, at the end of time, he will be able to say that scripture he will be able to say, this is the day of the Lord's vengeance, as Isaiah 34 says. And that will be when Jesus Christ comes back and his sword is bathed in blood at the Battle of Armageddon. And then what event would we expect next after Armageddon? After the wrath of God? Well, Isaiah 35 is the millennium starts where the blind see and the redeemed of the Lord return to Zion. So that's one yet another amazing picture, Isaiah 28 through 35. It's basically a loop of information about that last seven-year period. Now, could, could this continue? It's, could this miraculous little bits of information keep going on, Alan? Seems impossible, but hey, let's just look for fun, eh? What about Isaiah 40 through 43? Hmm. Isaiah 40 says, Jerusalem has received double for all her sins, but the faithful will rise up like eagles. Isn't that amazing? You know, there's a verse um, in the New Testament, Jesus talks about, you know, wherever the Son of Man is in the sky at my coming, basically, Alan Brooks' paraphrased version, there the vultures will gather, but... Some people, some people say that word could be eagles. So you can see that makes sense. After Jerusalem has received double for all her sins, then right when Jesus Christ is coming back, the faithful are going to rise up in the rapture like eagles. You know, it's that, that rapture. Now, if there's a seven-year before rapture, well, whatever. I, I, I want to go in the first one, but I think there's only one. But, you know, I don't want to argue about it. It's stupid. And Isaiah 41, then he says, continues the story of Revelation 19. It's Isaiah 41, he treads upon the rulers of the earth as if they were a potter treading the clay. And if you remember, Jesus says pretty much verbatim that about himself in Revelation 19. Then the next chapter, Isaiah 42 says, Jesus will be a light to the Gentiles. The Lord will march out in wrath. He was a, brood wheat, a bruised reed. He was silent. But now, and I will give you as a covenant, God says. Can you see that amazing prophecy there in Isaiah 42? Jesus will be a light to the Gentiles. The Lord will march out in wrath. He was a bruised reed. You know, we see this same picture in Isaiah 9, amazingly enough. You know, the famous scripture that talks about, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and his name is Wonderful Counselor. Well, in that scripture, in Isaiah 9, it says, um, you know, by way of the sea, verses 1, beyond Jordan, in the Galilee of the Gentiles, uh, the people who walked in darkness will see a great light, have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. That's the Lord Jesus coming back at Armageddon. Isn't that amazing? So anyway, that was just a little sidebar there. So Jesus 42, Isaiah 42 says, Jesus will be a light to the Gentiles. The Lord will march out in wrath. So we see that same picture that in darkness, as the world is in darkness, the sun, moon, and stars have fallen somehow. They're covered up or whatever. I don't know. There's this light that appears, and it's Jesus Christ. It's like, you know, kind of like the picture of the end of the Lord of the Rings, the two towers, you know, over the horizon in the darkness. You know, all of a sudden, this white horse arises and the light blinds everybody. And that's not by accident. That's the way he meant it. 
to represent Jesus Christ coming back. And it also starts doing these movie flashbacks about Jesus and his crucifixion there in Isaiah 42. He was a bruised reed. He was silent. I will give you Jesus as a covenant. Can you see that? Jesus was bruised. He was silent. So it's a little snippet flashback that, you know, the guy who's coming back in the light in the air, marching out in wrath, that guy who has a sword that's not mortal, that guy was also a covenant and a bruised reed who was crucified in silence. Isn't that amazing? You probably never saw that before or had anybody tell you about it. Then Isaiah 43 talks about the rapture. Amazingly enough, it talks about the sons are gathered from all over the earth to be with the Lord in the air. Now, you probably never heard that, that the rapture in the Old Testament, and yet it's right there. It is right there in Isaiah 43. It talks about that, I think it's verse uh, 5 through 7. It says, Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your descendants from the east and gather, the, gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up. And to the south, do not keep them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Isn't that amazing? That's the rapture people right there at the end of Isaiah 43. And it's the same, it's, it's the same picture we see over and over again. A, repeti- a repeating theme of the same information. The same God gave the same predictions with the same words and phrases about the same events, that Jesus Christ is going to come back and tread the rulers of the earth as the rapture takes place. And if you can see, look at Isaiah 40 and 41, it again proves my theory about description redescription. Isaiah 41, 40 and 41 are like a description about you know, when God comes back, he's coming back in the air. And the, the rapture happens, the one of Matthew 24. It says, he's sending out, uh, the faithful will rise up like eagles. And in Matthew 24, it says, they, you know, the saints are gathered from all over the earth. Then Isaiah 41, after the rapture happens, Jesus treads upon the rulers of the earth. Then Isaiah 42 repeats the same prophecy. Jesus comes back as a light to the Gentiles. He'll march out in wrath. And, you know, backtracks about, you know, his crucifixion. And then Isaiah 43 has another description of the rapture. So you can see Isaiah 40, 41, the description. Isaiah 42 and 43, the redescription of the same events. Isn't that amazing? It's absolutely stunning and amazing. And you've probably never heard it before. Isn't that crazy? Well, could there be any more of these in Isaiah? You're just, you're avalanche in my head with all these prophecies that are saying the same thing, Alan. Well, I hate to tell you, but there's even more. But let's take a little detour for a second. What detour could that be? Let's look at this amazing story Isaiah gives us about Jesus and his crucifixion. It's in five different chapters in the middle of Isaiah, starting with Isaiah 42. It says, I will give you as a covenant, as a light to the Gentiles. He shall be a bruised reed, and he shall not break. That's Isaiah 42. Jesus was given as a covenant, right? He was bruised, it says, later on in Isaiah 53, for our sins, and he's a light to the Gentiles. as He'll be a light streaking across the sky in Isaiah 9, as the world is in darkness from the sun, moon, and stars being darkened. So this picture is given over and over again that Jesus will be a light to the Gentiles. And if you remember Isaiah 60, it even says, well, you don't have to remember it because I haven't said it yet, but Isaiah 60 says, uh, Arise, shine, for the glory of the Lord has risen upon you, Jerusalem. It says Gentiles will come to your light. That's a picture of the rapture. So isn't that amazing? And Isaiah 49 says, The Lord shall give you as a covenant to restore the earth. Yeah, hey. Jesus was given as a covenant, right? And again, you can see in 42 and 49, it's proof positive of my theory, description, redescription, where, you know, prophecy is described. And in, in Isaiah 42, he's given as a covenant. In 49, 
he's given as a covenant. You see that? So it's the Lord is giving us the same prophecies over and over again in a loop. Isaiah 50, Jesus was spat upon by the Roman soldiers. It did happen. He was also given, he also gave his beard to be plucked out. That happened. He gave his back to those who hit him. And yes, that took place as well. Then Isaiah 52, Jesus was beaten by the Romans. His visage was marred more than any other man. Now, isn't that amazing? It even says there in Isaiah 52 that kings shall shut their mouths because of him. Now, picture the juxtaposition. When Jesus was crucified, he was silent, right? Now, Jesus said the tables will be turned when he comes back, that kings will actually be silent when he comes back, right? Then that leads up to Isaiah 53. That was Isaiah 52, which goes into, bleeds over, if you will, to Isaiah 53. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. By his stripes we were healed. He was led as a lamb to slaughter. He took the sins of the world. This is the, f the famous crucifixion passage, right? So we see there's a pattern here in the middle of Isaiah. It's like, you know, during a trial, there's a blood splatter experts which look at the pattern of the blood to find, you know, the, the key to solving the mystery. Well, here in the middle of Isaiah, we have the same. We have a blood splatter pattern that we can use to solve the mystery of, of Jesus Christ. In Isaiah 42, 49, 50, 52, and 53, there's secret messages about Jesus, his crucifixion, and his blood splatter pattern. He was a covenant. He was given by the Father. And he was truly beaten up and marred. His visage was marred. And he took our sins upon his back. And we should all be thankful. But this is, isn't this amazing, though, that you see this blood splatter pattern all throughout these five chapters? Now, getting back to our regularly scheduled programming, let's look at Isaiah 46 through 55. Yet one more loop of information about the end times. Isaiah 46 says, The Lord calls a bird of prey from the east to invade Israel. We've heard that before, right? The former Assyrian Empire is northeast, east of Israel. Isaiah 47 says, I was angry with my people. Uh, Israel says to God, I'm not going to sit as a widow. What you talking about, God? Georgia Bible. But God says, in one day you shall suffer widowhood and desolation. There's that word again, the D word, desolation. Then Isaiah 49 and 50 is a picture of the Lord coming back in the air. He goes, my mouth is like a sharp sword. Because of an invasion, Jerusalem will say to God, they'll cry out, God, you've forgotten about us. Hey, what about us? You know, how could you allow the Antichrist to invade us? But here in Isaiah 50, it says, I can't forget you, says God. I inscribed you, Israel, on the palms of my hands. Now, isn't that amazing? Now, unless we think that's a coincidence, you know, wink, wink, Jesus was crucified, which means the palms of his hands were inscribed with uh, the nails of the cross, right? And even in the same place, it says, I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks as well. So there's no doubt that this is Jesus was crucified, and that's why he cannot forget Israel. But he's telling Israel, I allowed this to happen to you on purpose. And Isaiah 51 and 52, as God is coming back, Jerusalem's crying out, where are you, God? Did you forget about us? He's going, well, I didn't. You know, I was crucified, people. Then it says, stand up, Jerusalem. The Lord's wrath has made you desolate. You see how these chap chapters fit together with a secret story? It's kind of like God in Isaiah 46 says, you know, I'm calling an invader from the east. God and that invader kind of you know, is going to come against Israel who doesn't think she's a widow. She doesn't think she needs Jesus to, to be her husband. And, you know, she's like rebellious, right? 
But God says, in one day, you shall suffer widowhood and desolation. So in that one day is when the Antichrist invades, right? And then Isaiah 49 and 50, as Jesus is in the air starting to come back, Jerusalem is all beaten up and and, and, uh, upset, and they thought God has forgotten her. And uh, Jesus said, no, I didn't forget you. You know, look what happened to me. I, I inscribed you on the palms of my hands, and I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks too. So no, I didn't forget you. Then, Isaiah 51 and 50, they say, stand up, Jerusalem. You can see the picture now. Jesus is coming back to Israel. They're all upset. They're thinking, God, you forgot about us. And he's like pointing to his hands and saying, no, looky, looky. Here's my hands and my back and my cheeks. I didn't forget you. I'm coming back right now to rescue you. I just had a plan. And as he's coming back, the next two chapters say, what his plan is. He says, stand up, Jerusalem. You know, you're, you're down in the dust right now. The Lord's wrath has made you, what, desolate. But now I'm going to comfort you. And then that's when the redeemed of the Lord will return to Zion with singing. Awake, Zion. You've been sleeping in the dust. But now you're going to be redeemed without money. And it says in these chapters, all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. And the kings of the earth will have nothing to say. And that's turning the tables. Uh, Why will they have nothing to say? Because the very next chapter, Isaiah 53, is about the crucifixion of Jesus. Where he was what? He was silent. He had nothing to say when he was being crucified in Isaiah 53. So Isaiah 52 is telling you that the kings of the earth will also be silent when the Lord comes back and put some crucifixion on their tail feathers, if you know what I mean, Georgia Bible. So, Isaiah 53 is the crucifixion. He was quiet. Then Isaiah 54 says, Sing, barren Jerusalem, sing. You know, the Lord is going to be your husband. You're not going to be a widow anymore. So you can see the connection here. Isaiah 47, Israel says, I'm not going to be a widow. We're not going to be judged. What you talking about, God? inner city Bible version. But God says to them in Isaiah 47, yes, you are going to be a widow. In one day, you're going to be a widow. And then the end of this little loop, which proves my theory, uh, it says, sing, barren Jerusalem, you're not a widow anymore now. I'm going to marry you. You see that? Then Isaiah 55 starts the thousand-year reign of Christ when it says, come, you know, drink free water, buy with no buy food with no money. That's the millennium. So you can see how all these are connected. It's like one little story of our loop, which if you remember, our loop is one where Israel is gonna be invaded from the northeast, north, east, whatever, by Assyria, the Antichrist. And Israel doesn't think they need anything, but you know, they do. And God says in 47 that you, you're going to suffer widowhood in one day, basically. Then, three and a half years later, Isaiah 49 and 50, uh, God comes back. Uh, well, how do we know that? Because it says, my mouth is like a sharp sword. And that's exactly what Jesus says in Revelation 19, Revelation 14. He's coming back, and out of his mouth is a large sword. You know, again, same God, same scriptures. Same predictions, same words and phrases. Is that too difficult? No. Even for the experts, maybe. <laughs> anyway, and, and as, as, there come, as Jesus starts to come back in Isaiah 49 and 50, Jerusalem will think, you know, God, you forgot about us, you know? Why did you allow this to happen? You know, we're, we're supposed to be your chosen people. And he goes, I can't forget about you. How, why, why can't I? Because look at my hands. Israel, I, I was crucified, and I inscribed you on the palms of my hands, and I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks as well. And then as he's coming back, he further says in Isaiah 51 and 52, Stand up, Jerusalem, the Lord's wrath has made you desolate, but now, now I will comfort you. And now the redeemed of the Lord will come and return with Zion with singing. Awake, awake, you're going to be redeemed without money. It's free. 
And then it says in Isaiah 52, I think, all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of God and all the kings will be silent. And we go into a flashback mode of Isaiah 53. Why they're silent? Because Jesus was silent when he was crucified. Then Isaiah 54 and 55, sing, barren Jerusalem. You're barren now, but sing because I'm your husband. I just came back in the air and I'm going to marry you. And what am I going to do? When, um, when I marry you, we're going to start this thousand-year reigning thing where food is free and water is free, like Isaiah 55 says. So it's pretty clear, it's amazingly clear, that Isaiah 46 through 55 is yet one more loop story, one more story about the last three and a half years of time. Now let's move on to our next uh, loop of information. Now let's say we just finished one, which we did, with the Lord coming back. How would the next loop start? Well, we know that there's a last seven-year period, right, that starts with uh, a seven-year peace treaty. And in the middle, the Antichrist invades uh, at the three-and-a-half-year mark. And then at the final, at the end of the seven years, the Lord comes back, right? Well, so what would we expect? Could there be a bad treaty? Well, Gee, lo and behold, Isaiah 57 says, Israel makes a bad pact and the righteous perish. Just like Daniel 9.27, if you remember, Israel's going to make a treaty or the Antichrist is going to make a treaty somehow to make Israel feel secure. And then, um, so that's pretty amazing, right? Then Isaiah 58 says, Raise your voice like a trumpet and declare my people to my people their rebellion. Again, we see another end-time theme that God's going to be a little upset with his people for some reason. They're rebellious, maybe because they started sacrificing again. I don't know. Isaiah 59, the next chapter. There's no truth anywhere in the world. So Jesus cloaks himself with the garments of vengeance. We've seen the same theme over and over again. God's upset with his people. Here it doesn't say he allows them to be invaded, but... He did, right? And so when he does, he, uh, the, he dresses himself with the garments of vengeance, as we've already seen in Revelation 19. It pretty much has identical prophecy about the same event. And what, we, what would we expect next, then? The Lord gets ready for to come back in Isaiah 59, and then in Isaiah, Isaiah 60, he does come back. Darkness covers the earth, Isaiah 60. Jerusalem, arise and shine, for the glory of the Lord is coming. Remember how Ezekiel 11 said, the glory of the Lord leaves heaven and comes down and stands on a mountain east of Jerusalem. And Zechariah 14.4 says that the Lord will come and stand on that mountain when he comes back. So it has to be Jesus Christ. All throughout Isaiah, it talks about a time of darkness. Isaiah 9, the world is in darkness. And the, the, the Messiah streaks through the sky. Here at Isaiah 60, 59, it says he's preparing to come back. 60, he comes back in darkness. He says the same message we saw in so many of our loops already, that is, Jerusalem is downtrodden, they're upset, they're desolated, and they're looking upwards, and Jesus said, Now arise, I'm back. Now arise, Israel, arise, Jerusalem, I'm back. And then it says also here in Isaiah 60, foreigners will rebuild your walls. Could that be Christians? Could we be the foreigners? You know, there's a cool prophecy in Micah. We've all heard about how, you know, the Messiah would come from Bethlehem. But if you read right around there, it's Micah 5. If you read around there, it also says that Israel will cut off or be kind of, uh, you know, ostracizing to this Messiah until he comes back with the west of his brothers. And that's why, you know, Isaiah 54 says, expand the pegs of your tent. You know, there's a lot of people coming back with Jesus, and they're the Gentiles. That's why it says Gentiles will be drawn to your light in one of the scriptures we looked at earlier. Because we will. The Gentile Christians are going to come up to the light of Jesus as the world is in darkness. We're going to streak up in the rapture, and be with him as he's coming back. And that picture is fantastically presented here. Then Isaiah 61, Jesus 
reads that famous scripture, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of his vengeance. Well, one can see how in, in, the, in sequence, he's finishing up the day of his vengeance in Isaiah 61. And uh, so that's one more loop in our loop plantation. And so let's look for, to see if there's any others, okay? Could the last chapters of Isaiah actually have the same information? Well, by golly, they do, amazingly enough. Isaiah 62, it says, Jerusalem shall no longer be called desolate. Gee, how many times have we heard the D word? A lot, huh? It says, raise a banner to the nation. Your Savior comes. Raise a banner to the nations. That's a euphemism for Jesus standing as a banner in the dark sky. And he's coming. He's coming back. And he's coming back strong. And Jerusalem, the desolate city, he will redeem her himself. Then Isaiah 63, what would we expect to happen as the Lord comes back? He's going to tread the winepress of his wrath, it says in so many of the scriptures we've looked at. And lo and behold, what does it say in Isaiah 63? Those very words. It says, this is the day of his vengeance. And you can see perfectly the, the uh, description, redescription theory proved yet again. We saw earlier, just a minute ago, how uh, it says, you know, the acceptable year of the Lord's favor and the day of his vengeance. And now we see he's carrying out that a couple of chapters later. This is the day of his vengeance. This is the winepress of his wrath and matches Revelation 14, 19, which says when Jesus comes back on a cloud, the angel thrust a sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. Same words, same God, same prophecies, same events. Got it? Isaiah 64. You know, it's, it's like what we already saw, the repeating loop. I feel like sometimes I'm Bill Murray and Groundhog Day. You know what I mean? It's like God it keeps happening. Gee, it's amazing. Isaiah 64, we saw earlier how Israel's crying out, Lord, Isaiah 59 through 62, they cry out, Lord, please come back. Jerusalem is what? We're a desolate. We're a desolation. Come help us. And remember they said, did you even forget about us? And Jesus said, no, looky, looky, here's my hands. I inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Then Isaiah 65 talks about what? After God comes back and rescues Jerusalem, he talks about judgment. It said, judgment's coming to Judah, but the Lord will not destroy them all. He's going to leave a remnant. And that's another script, uh, another uh, theme of scripture that I didn't, have not gone into very much but there's many places it talks about he'll leave a remnant of his people to rule with him at the end of time. Then Isaiah 66, as we've seen in so many scriptures, Israel's crying out, they're desolate, they're upset, and the Lord's going to comfort them when he comes back. And when he comes back, he's going to come back and fire, and he's going to, you know, kick everybody's tail feathers, right? The Georgia Bible. And he's going to say, you know, there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. So, you know, we see this, we've seen this in Isaiah eight times, the same pattern, a peace treaty. Israel's invaded from the north by the Assyrian. And then at the end, God comes back in the darkness. Why? Because the sun and moon and stars are darkened when come, Jesus comes back. We've even seen a trumpet blow. We've seen the dead rise, the rapture. It's unbelievable the things we've seen so far in the scriptures and how the other scriptures actually match uh, what Isaiah says too. So it's not just a one-off. Not only is there eight loops or nine loops or whatever it is in Isaiah, there's the same information using the same words and phrases in Zechariah, in uh, Ezekiel, in Jeremiah. It's all throughout the Old Testament. It's amazing. It's something you've never seen before. First time here, and I hope you like it. Isn't that just astounding? I guarantee you've never heard this in, by any teacher. And I'm not saying that to say that I'm great, because really, it's a testament to God, because I ain't that smart. But this is just amazing. I think it's so cool. Don't miss out on seeing what God's saying. It's the same 
repeating story, the same prophecy over and over again that starts with a peace treaty, starts with Israel in a false peace, and ends with God coming back in the air and rescuing all the Christians around the world and bringing them back to Israel where we'll live for a thousand years with him in peace, the real thousand-year reign of Christ. Isn't that just astounding? It's absolutely amazing to me. It still causes, causes my jaw to drop even today. Even how not only is there this repeating loop of secret information in Isaiah, but how Daniel, uh, Ezekiel, Jeremiah all have the same information using the same words and phrases from, you know, Israel's living in a bad peace to a bad peace treaty. And on that day, Israel will be invaded. They'll have to flee, which is what Jesus said. Then, you know, then sometime later, there's going to be Armageddon. You know, even though all these Old Testament verses don't spell out the 42-month period, we know that's what's going to happen because Daniel says it uh, several times, and so does John in Revelation. And Jesus even says, when you see the abomination spoken of by the prophet Daniel, which is this big Assyrian invasion of Israel, which is why they have to flee. And once they flee, Israel's not there anymore to have a peace treaty at the end of the final seven years, right? So we see the same picture throughout the entire Bible. One God presented one picture about the one end of time. And it's just simple. It's, I mean, it's not simple, simple, but it's just easy to see when you look at it this way. When you look back at prophecies like we would look at a book and highlight Pearl Harbor and highlight the atomic bomb at Hiroshima, if we saw that repeating loop of information 20 times, we would know that, you know, World War II would start with Pearl Harbor and last 42 months and end with the H-bomb. Likewise, the day of the Lord, you know, we've seen it already many times and it happens a lot more actually, starts when people say peace, Israel is invaded from the north, and they flee. Then it ends 42 months later with Jesus Christ coming back with his church, starting the millennium where, you know, everything's free. It doesn't cost to, to eat anything or drink anything, as Isaiah 55 says. So, you know, I think it's easy to see, and I think it's really amazing new discovery that like the way Jesus fulfilled the Psalms, not with every single word of every single chapter of the Psalms applying to Jesus, but no, some of it did, some of it didn't. And so like the way you knew to look for Jesus, like, you know, my best friend betrayed me, or when, you know, whatever, something like that, all the Psalms of Psalm 34 through 43, you know, there's a little snippet about Jesus that was what I call a prophetic utterance. And so, no, everything isn't hermeneutical, but yes, it's accurate. And we can see if we get rid of the riffraff, like if you saw, if there was a secret message in a cornfield, you really couldn't see it from ground level, but if you flew in a plane, you could see that huge message. Like that, if you, if you remove the riffraff or the non-applicable words... You can see the secret message is there, and it's in consecutive chapters for the most part, which I know they didn't have chapters, but they, the, the important part is it's the sequence. The sequence is there over and over, not once, not twice, not five times, not ten times. I don't know, what have we seen it? Probably 20 times so far, and it's yet there's probably 15 more we're going to look at, uh, you know, in future chapters. I mean, you know, we've seen this all in just um, Ezekiel uh, Jeremiah and Jesus and then Isaiah, but there's still Zechariah. I call it the sixth gospel. Every chapter pretty much in Zechariah is about Jesus. It's astounding. It's unbelievable. I, I, can't even, I can't even think about it. Then you have the same stories in Joel. In Hosea, the same story yet again. Zechar you know, Zephaniah, you know, it's all there. It's like all these prophets got had a download from God using the same words, and they kept giving this secret repeating loop of information. It's kind of like, you know, a destroyer, World War II, sinking. They're using Morse code, but they're signaling the same signal over and over and over again. Help us, help us, S-O-S, S-O-S. 
Likewise, the Bible signaling all of us, SOS, the end is near. Here's the real key for understanding it. And I hope it's the real key. I believe it is. And if it's not, well, you know, I could be wrong. Nobody's perfect. Anyway, especially not me. I wish you the best. I hope you have a wonderful day. And thank you for listening to part three, Secret Stories of Jesus in the Old Testament. And this has all been all about Isaiah. And it just makes my jaw drop. I mean, almost every chapter in the book of Isaiah has to do with the end of time or Jesus. And that's just astounding to me. And I hope it is to you. God bless you. Alan Brooks. And if you want my book, it's called The Loop. Email me at abrook, no S, 8, at aol.com, the number 8, abrook8 at aol. And, uh, you know, you could PayPal $12. Then I'll e-book you a copy right over. Lots of huge, big charts, lots of wonderful things that aren't hard to see. And I just I look into pretty much every single Old Testament uh, end-time verse. And that's something that, as far as I know, nobody's done. Nobody's done. Most of these uh, experts and end-time prophecy teachers, they're wonderful people. They're trying to do the right thing, and they put together their own theories based on mostly the New Testament and a few snippets of information in the Old. And, you know, I get that. I respect that. I just happen to see something. And, you know, I'm so sometimes being not smart and not a Ph.D.-educated person can help. Maybe you can see what these other people can't see because they've been programmed in a different way, like the Pharisees 2,000 years ago were programmed to, to look for Jesus in a different way. Anyway, God bless you. This is Alan Brooks signing off on another teaching of secret stories of Jesus in the Old Testament. Thank you.